as we celebrate the broadcast premiere of the Russian Five film on your PBS station, a perfect time to bring in the coach, Scotty Bowman, uh, for a great conversation about hockey. And this event, 25 years ago, the Russian Five first went on the ice. Uh, coach, time flies. It sure does. And, uh, you know, when I got to Detroit, of course, uh, we had Vladimir Konstantinov and Sergei Fedorov with Slava Kozlov had just started. He came over from Russia started in the minors but not didn't stay very long and had a great first year and, and then we were looking for a defenseman uh, actually uh, at the trade deadline and uh, so we were looking for depth to be to be truthful about it and uh, Slava Fatisov was in New Jersey but he wasn't playing very much so we made the deal to get Slava and uh, we, had a, we had a good run that year but we got beat in the finals four straight by his old team New Jersey and and he had kept mentioning to me uh, during that time, my good friend Igor Larionov, and we knew him because he he single-handedly just about beat us with San Jose in uh, in the playoffs in '94. So he said, you know, he'd like to come to Detroit, and I said, well, I don't think they ever trade him. But we had a surplus of wingers, and uh, I I, uh, I was able to make the trade to uh, to get uh, Igor. We traded a good player, Ray Shepard. He was a good goal scorer, but we had other right wingers, Dino Cicerelli, Marty Lapointe was coming along. So it made a lot of sense and we, we got Igor in there and and then about oh maybe a month into the season uh, they were we had, we hadn't even practiced with them and we started to practice them and they looked looked different used them in Calgary one night and just a few weeks ago was the anniversary of that time and they had the puck the whole game and it was amazing when they were on the ice we won the game three to nothing and uh, then that started it and I, I was careful like I didn't know. Uh, you know, if other teams would try to try to defend them, it would be pretty hard to defend them because people had never seen them play, and yeah. neither had the players in the NHL. So it was uh, it was a unique time for us, and uh, gave us a dimension that other teams didn't have, and and that resulted in the, those first two back-to-back -back cups. Yeah, it was, and of course, uh, it was a unique style of of play. Uh, on the surface, it's, uh, you know, a finesse style. It seems to be a little higher order of finesse than uh, the game that we are used to. But it's really built on discipline and what happens in the neutral zone. Talk about the neutral zone because that, to me, and a lot of hockey fans and uh, amateur coaches, is something that we're always trying to get some success with. Well, it's, it's odd that we would do this Zoom call uh, uh, just two hours ago. I had a call from Igor Larionov and uh, – it was a twofold call. He's turning 60 uh, on December the 2nd and his home, he's living in Moscow. He's coaching the U.S. or the uh, Russian uh, uh, junior team uh, going to play a, in the World Championships up in Edmonton in December. So he, he got talking and he went, he took his junior team to a Finnish tournament. Uh, it's called the Kerala Cup. And the other team, Sweden and Czech Republic and Finland, used their, their top team, their senior team. But Russia... The Russian senior players were playing in the KHL, so they, they snuck in there with the junior team to get some work done before the World Championship. Well, what do you know what they won? They won, the, they won the tournament. They have an excellent young goalie that drafted this year by Nashville. So Igor was talking to me, and he said, uh, I said, how are how you liking your coaching? You know, I always thought he could be a, a good coach, and he's such a unique guy. And he said, well, it, it, it was a little different. I, I, I stress puck possession. And he said, you know, the, the players, in the, the, a few of them, maybe half a dozen are playing in the KHL at a young age. And he said, you know, in the KHL, they want to make that long pass up to the far blue line and the guy tips the puck in and then they, then they just wait till the other team comes back. And he said, I, I have a hard time with it because I want puck possession. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's another story with Igor. He, he left us uh, to go to the Florida Panthers and he stayed about half a season but they wanted him to shoot the puck in and he rebelled against that style. And then all of a sudden uh, that was in the, in the uh, two, uh, 2001 season and we brought him back and would you know it? We won another cup with that, with that uh, system, but he's, he's, he stressed puck possession. He, 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 he's got a young team in, in Russia. Now he, he did the same thing with us. He was kind of, they called him the professor. And of course, he and Slava had been a member of the five-man unit uh, previously in Russia. So the, the idea was that you didn't have to chase the puck. You kept the puck. Somebody would be open. 
players kept moving in the neutral zone, rotating around. And all of a sudden, when I, when I first looked at it and they were starting to practice it, and then all of a sudden you'd see the guy that seemed to get the breakaways, oddly enough, was Konstantinov. He came from the right defense slot and he'd yeah. be coming up the ice and I get to the other blue line, he gets a pass and he's got a breakaway. So it, it, it's, it's odd that we're 25 years later and Igor Larionov is still coaching uh, and he's still stressing puck possession. And I think it's spilled over on the rest of our North American players that we we were able to uh, to keep the puck a lot. And, and it, it makes sense. If you have the puck, your your defensive vulnerability is not very, not very much because the other team has to get it off you. So I, I've always, uh, I mean, that, that, that really taught me a big lesson. I mean, I, I had good teams in Montreal and we had good puck possession, but uh, the Russian five in, reinforced it uh, with us in, in uh, Detroit from the late 90s into 2002. Well, I think what we all appreciated uh, was seeing uh, the Russian five integrating with something literally called the grind line and making those two styles or those systems complement uh, one another. I guess that was by design. Well, you know, when you think about it, when you have four lines and if two or three of them play different styles, it makes, it makes it tough to defend on the other team because you're not playing the same thing all the time. So all of a sudden, you're right. The grind line was was there. There they they stressed forechecking. They stressed uh, physicality. They could they could defend. And then you turn around, and then the Russian five would come out, and you and, and they would play offense. So it, it really threw a good monkey wrench into the other teams. It wasn't always that way, but they they did a good job of making sure that it was tough to play against. And it seems. Uh at least from a fan's perspective, you were always a coach that stressed a system um, over star players. And, and then you had to get people to change their game and let the star shine when they could shine, but also be a part of a greater system for success. You're right. And, uh, you know, the mixture of the team. Uh, and I, I like the fact that uh, we had we had the, we had the size and, and I think to win in the league, and it's no different now, if you if you can't play physical at times, or you can't play puck possession, or you can't play defense, and I, I I was always one that could stress defense because no matter how you're going to do it and how you're going to win, you've got to get a lead, you got to score, and then you got to defend that lead. And uh, the good players can 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 play that way. We were fortunate in Detroit, of course. Steve Eiserman became a, a the, I think the the, the top two way player in the league. Gave up a lot of his offense to play defense. Nick Lindstrom would be a good example when you look at his stats. Uh, Nick was uh, was premier defenseman for a decade, at least, and uh, won all those Norris trophies, well deserved. But he could play offense and defense, and they just had that sixth sense about them. Uh, what is it? They know how to. They, I mean, they call it hockey IQ, but it's it's having like a sixth sense. They know where the players are around them. Um, they don't give the puck away. Uh, they they know it's it's hard to get back. So uh, that was a big part of the, the Red Wings style. And uh, other teams have picked it up. And the good teams, uh, that's, I mean, the Lightning just won this year. And, of course, Steve was instrumental in building that team. But they, they, they showed what they could do. Uh, they got good skill players. And skill players can win games if they play the right way. Wait, and the, the uh, throwing the puck to open ice by design and get and having a, a guy meet uh, the puck uh, where it lands seemed to be something that maybe the Russian five maybe modeled a little bit for, for the other players because, at least from a fan's perspective, it seemed like they picked up a little bit of that uh, uh, finesse from the Russian five players. Well, the Russians started to play a different style when they learned the game. And, and, the, and the Summit Series, they call it, the 72 Series, Team Canada against uh, Team Russia went eight mm-hmm. games before it was over. Canada finally won late in the, in the eighth game. But the uh, we didn't see that kind of style in North America because all of a sudden their defensemen would always pass it to each other in the defensive zone. The f- two forwards would take off and leave the zone, which was that was, that was a no-no in, in our game. They would leave the zone. They'd crisscross in the neutral zone and... Automatically, when they when we saw that for the first time, 
it pulled our defensemen in North America out of the end zone and it, it left them because they, they didn't want these players to get breakaways. And, and, and when you think about it, that was when there was a red line in. The center line was sort of like a, a protector for the defensive team. Now, of course, you can go all the way up to the far blue line without the center line. So that was the amazing part of the, the Russian style that they, we, we had a tough time in that series and it was a good, it's supposed to be a one-sided series, but why, why it was not one-sided is we never see that style. And I think it's like all sports. When you see a style for the first time, whatever sport you're playing, I mean, people get onto it and they'll eventually be able to, to defense it. But the guy that starts it, the team that starts it, it's got a big edge. And they brought that to the NHL. They crisscrossed wingers. When I first started in this league, if you're a right winger, you had one third of the ice and you stayed there. And if you're a left winger, you had the far side. And if you're in the middle, you're the center. And very few players used to cross from one zone to another, like from one, one side to another. And now, now it's integrated into the NHL. It's, it looks a little helter-skelter for me now, you know, growing up with a, a, a more standard style. But that's, you have to live with the, with the present. And uh, I enjoy trying to change and look at what, what we see now. And the players are so fast and it's, it's such a different game. But the Russians did change a lot of the thinking um, for North America, you know, uh, teams back in started in the 70s and it and it progressed and i would say edmonton oilers in the 80s took advantage of skilled offensive players that could outscore you and uh, and they won i think they won five cups in seven years or something yeah and it's a it's remarkable they uh, people uh teams learn to defend a new system but then they be, of course begin to uh emulate it Appreciate you uh, taking the time with us. We talked about the professor. I just want to talk about each of the players individually uh, real quick. Uh, when you walked into the team 93-94, uh, Sergei Fedorov uh, was a MVP and uh, really a, a dominant force. Uh, how was it working with uh, Sergei Fedorov from the beginning? He was a unique Russian player in that he, he first came into Detroit the year before, the year before I was there. He was a solid defensive player. He, he, could, he could play defense. His offense wasn't there yet, but it, you could see it was going to be. He had, he had a core, and he was a strong, he was, he was a lot bigger and stronger than he, than if you saw him, I mean, he, he was over, he was about nearly 200 pounds. He had legs like tree, tree stung, uh, trunks, and uh, he could play offense and defense. That's what, one thing he could do. We moved him back on defense for about six weeks. He looked like a, 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 an all-star. And he, he was a unique player because he was equally uh, proficient offensively and defensively. And well, and definitely was, a load. Uh, it, uh, and Kozlov also a lot of, uh, a lot of promise uh, with, with that uh, prospect, I guess. Uh, but really, he, he took to that style and, and he flourished within the Red Wing system. Kozlov and Fedorov played most of their career together. We brought Slava up there. It's probably about a th three-year difference in age, but... Slava could put the puck in the net. His first year in Detroit, he scored 34 goals as a rookie. I think he flew under the radar, really. He, um, you know, he was he was such an important part of our, our offense when when I first got there, and uh, you know, he 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 just could he knew where to go in in the in the offensive zone, and Sergey was a great passer, so it was a great combination, and. Uh, you know, and then Vladimir Konstantinov was just such a, I mean, he, he would have been challenging. <laughs> he and he probably would have been challenging Nick Lidstrom for a lot of the trophy, you know, the, the Norris trophy for the best defenseman because he had a unique style of players. He took no prisoners. He was aggressive, probably one of the more aggressive Russian players in history. Yeah. And a tragic accident, as you, everyone knows, but, um, you know, we all remember how great a player he was. Well, and, and finally, of course, uh, when you got Slava Fatisov, you got depth, but you also got a hockey mind, uh, a leader uh, in depth in, in the sense of, uh, well, geez, what he's doing today just sh shows his experience and his tendency to be uh, helpful to the younger players, I guess. Yeah, he, 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 he worked as a minister of sport for a couple of years and, now he's working on academies like he there 
they, I, I, I like the idea of what they do over there. I mean, they have a big advantage, as you know, Russia. There's no NFL football. There's no basketball or, or, or baseball. So <clears throat> they're getting top athletes to play hockey, and uh, they're pouring a lot of money. It's a big country. And the kids, uh, they, they don't stress. They, in the early going, um, and I know I talked to Igor again this morning, they stress fundamentals. They don't, they don't use score clocks for you really young kids. Kids, mm -hmm. They want you to learn how to skate and pass yeah. and shoot. And, and then, you know, that's what they, that's their style. And, uh, they, they, maybe, maybe we could, maybe we could think about that. You know, I mean, I got some grandkids that are just starting in sports and it's so much stress on winning, you know, and, uh, I had a quick, just a quick story. I had a grandson that, Played flag, plays flag, flag football in in uh, uh, Boston. My daughter's son, and uh, they they lost the championship game, and uh, you know they got they came second, and and they lost the game, and uh, they got their uh, the winning team got trophies, and he got a ring, and and you know he was so upset. He was not. I mean, you know, I, I had to sort of tell my daughter. I said, look, the, 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 they they had a great season. They didn't win. They came second, but you know, uh, but we stress winning a lot, and uh, you know, at a young age, because I, I don't know, I, you know, as people grow up and finish school and finish college or whatever they do and get into business, get a job, we compete long enough in our lives, you know. That if right. we start competing at six and seven, you know, it's nothing wrong with it. I guess you learn. It's just a philosophy I have. I, I, I would like to see us in sports. In the early going, uh, teach us how to play, um, with maybe not as much stress on on a, a winner and a loser. I mean, I know it's got to come eventually, but mm -hmm. push it back a little bit. Well, yeah, and it's it's uh, one great thing that USA Hockey does in their uh, uh, coaching certification training is the very first day, level one, they show you what chance you have, less than a tenth of a percent, maybe, of all maybe. the youth hockey players just in North America of getting to the NHL. So just reinforcing that with uh, make it uh, fun, make it fun. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, listen, uh, we're so grateful that you took some time to share with us. We're celebrating the, the 25th anniversary of the, the time they first went on the ice, but also this remarkable film, the Russian five premiering on PBS, uh, your PBS station coach, Scotty Bowman, our great thanks for sharing some time with us. Well, thank you. And my best wishes. It's a great film. Thank you. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.